Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Kalamat. Yeah, it's indeed a pleasure and a privilege and an honor to be presenting, especially when Dr. Anand Vijay Raman, yourself, uh, the chair. And I'm really sorry about the delay, that is my fault. And there was another problem that I had to be. And so, without much ado, we will start uh, the discussion on a therapeutic update on asthma. So, asthma is a common disease, and uh, it is uh, sometimes it's, it can be described as a conundrum, actually. Now, if you were in 5000 AD, if you had asthma, wheezing, probably you might have had the divine intervention to get some care. But if you were lucky to be in Egypt about 3,500 years before, probably uh, the medicinal person would give you some uh, natural uh, leaves to be, to be kept, kept on, on a hot, hot uh, uh, clove, clove so, so that, that you will be able to inhale the substance and get rid of it. And if you are in China, China uh, excuse me, I can hear my... Uh, my uh, I can hear my echo right now, I'm sorry. Okay. So if you were in China, probably this medicinal person would have given you some what we call yellow tea, which contains epidra. And uh, further improvements uh, in asthma care, if I may say, you know, in, when the British came into India, they identified the uh, medicinal uh, values of datura, and then they made a cigarette, especially these uh, colonial soldiers, when they went back, they took this uh, datura leaves and they made it into cigarettes, so asthma cigarettes. So, you know, there, there, there are various ways that asthma was treated. You know, some people prescribed fox liver, bloodletting, and uh, there were the various ways that asthma was treated when the, uh, when in the medical fraternity. But when you look at these treatment options, we know that datura has atrophine, which is anti muscarinic which dilates the airways. And uh, if you look at the yellow tea, uh, it contains epidrine, the beta agonist, which is also having a uh, bronchodilator effect. So, main emphasis was probably bronchodilation. And that trend didn't actually change much. So, we call it the asthma pendulum. Uh, it was described by Dr. Uh, Professor Ann Woodlock, where mainly in the 1960s, we understood that there are abnormalities in the airway where the narrowing of the airway is the main pathophysiological abnormality that you can see in asthma patients. Hence, the treatment was targeted towards dilating these airways so that you will get a relief. In the 1970s, with the advent of the steroids, you know, we, they understood that when they analyzed these small airways, there was an inflammatory process, mainly an eosinophilic inflammatory process. Hence, the pendulum shifted towards, rather than treating the symptomatic asthma, 
we were we trying to give an anti-inflammatory treatment for these patients instead of that. But in the 1990s, then again it shifted, right? So there was a combination of inflammation as well as airway dysfunction. And we know that certain asthma types that we now describe actually doesn't have an inflammatory component in them. It has simply an airway dysfunction. So this penundulum has been going from one place to another. And now we have, to a certain extent, a clear idea about what asthma really is. And uh, now we have come into the middle ground to say that there is an inflammatory process, especially when we are dealing with the eosinophilic asthma or type 2 asthma together with airway dysfunction that is there. So this has major treatment implications. So when we look at asthma as a whole, especially the asthma that we know at present, I would like to go through this uh, uh, this diagram with you. So when an allergen, allergen is a substance that can cause a, what we call an allergic reaction, either IgE or eosinophilic mediated inflammation. So what happens is when this comes into the epithelium, it is engulfed by the dendritic cells and the antigen, and it is itself an antigen presenting cell. And it is presented to the naive T cell, which is through the T cell receptors. And this, when you present this to the T cell receptor, to this naive T cell, in the appropriate milieu of cytokines, it is converted into a Th2 type of a cell. So why not Th1 type of a cell? It is called atopy. We are genetically predisposed to, in the asthmatic patients, especially if you have the condition called, they call atopy, Rather than going into the Th1 pathway, which is the normal pathway in a normal person, you go into the Th2 type pathway. There are various postulations why this happens, but one, it says that it is genetically predisposed, but there are some environmental factors coming into play as well. So when this Th2 type of cells are activated, we have the Th2 type of cytokine, mainly three cytokines. We have interleukin-4, interleukin-13, and interleukin Five. And when we look at interleukin-5, it is one of the most important cytokines that increases the eosinophilic amount in the blood as well as in the tissue, and it causes eosinophilic aggregation and an eosinophilic inflammation. And when you look at the histology, you might see increased amount of eosinophils. And if you look at the phenol, that means exhaled nitric oxide, you will see an increasing of Excel nitric oxide in these patients compared to other patients. So then if you look at the Th2 other cell type, you will see that the patient is having uh, interleukin 4 and 13. This interleukin 4 and 13 together will class switch the B cell to produce IgE instead of IgG and IgM. So when you have IgE, what happens is when you have IgG and IgM, it usually is able to bind to this allergen and then neutralize it and helps it be or to be opsonized by the immune system. But this IgE can bind to the mast cells. And when it binds to the mast cells, when the allergen is exposed again, this interaction can cause a degranulation of the mast cells and hence cause a histamine and bradykinin and vasoactive substance release, which can cause uh, the symptoms like hyperreactivity of the airway, smooth muscle contraction, increasing of secretions, as well as uh, uh, cough and other symptoms in asthma. So these cytokines for the postgraduates are very important to understand, especially when you are trying to understand the treatment of severe asthma. Interleukin-4 and interleukin-13 are very important cytokines, even though it is an important thing, as I said, in class switching, especially interleukin-13 has a major effect in remodeling of the airways. So we thought that asthma was a completely reversible disease, but when you have recurrent attacks of asthma, we sometimes see patients that they have very difficult to treat and their improvement is 
poor and there are permanent damage to the airways. And if it is coming to a long term, sometimes they can develop chronic uh, airway obstruction as well. So one of the major factors or interleukins that are relevant here is interleukin 30, which increases the mucus production as well as the mucus uh, hypertrophy of the smooth muscle. And then we have interleukin 5 together with interleukin 13, again, increasing the eosinophil count. So earlier, interleukin 4 and 5 were the most important interleukins that we consider. And when you look at this chart or diagram, you will understand that interleukin 13 has a major effect in both pathways in the asthma, asthma pathophysiology in type 2 asthma. So there is another cell in the sideline that I would like to introduce to you, that is the immune cell 2, and it secretes interleukin 33, 25, and thymic stroma lympho lymphoprotein. So this cell is the one that connects the viral infection or inflammation with the asthma pathway. And we see especially in small children, in certain groups, when or even in adults, we saw this in COVID, when you have a viral infection, sometimes the quiescent asthma gets triggered and activated. And sometimes these patients have symptoms that are similar to asthma, not in all patients who are prone to get asthma. We have a family history of asthma. So that pathway is through this uh, ILC2 cell, right? So the reason that I talk to you about this is that this is the type of asthma that we already know, TH2 driven asthma. So why do we need a definition for asthma? Basically, it's difficult to define asthma because asthma has no true definition. If you read this definition, it can be anything. It can be an inflammatory disease. It can be a non-inflammatory disease, right? And it is a non-specific symptoms that we are talking about in asthma. But anyway, what we can understand is that asthma is a symptom. It is not a simple disease. It is an umbrella term which we describe a lot of symptoms and gathering of symptoms. So in these symptoms, we divide into phenotypes depending on the symptoms, the exacerbation rate, and the destruction of the lung types. And then we endotype them, looking at the underlying uh, pathways that are responsible, that are driving this asthma uh, phenotypes. Right. So this is basically how we divide asthma for the postgraduates. Basically, we have what we call type 2 or eosinophilic asthma, and then we have the non-eosinophilic asthma. So in eosinophilic asthma, the hallmark is when they will have sputum or bronchial viral lavage increased eosinophilia. They will have eosinophilic infiltration in the smooth muscle if you do a biopsy. And then their pheno, uh, fraction of expired nitric oxide levels will be high if you do that. And the good thing is that these patients are steroid responsive. So they, most of them, most of them will respond to simple inhalers or steroids if we give them correctly. So the eosinophils, the mast cells, and the ILC2 cells, the interleukin 4, 13, are the hallmarks here. But there are types of asthma where when we do a bronchial lavage, there will be no cells at all. So that is called the post-granulatic inflammation, where Th1 type of inflammation is there. And here, you interferon gamma and TNF alpha are the main substances. Then we have the neutrophilic asthma, interleukin 17 driven asthma. So basically, we have three types of asthma now, and that is a different pathway that is going on. So why do we know we need to know this? Especially if we know the pathophysiology, then we can have tailored treatment because asthma is a syndrome. And you will understand that patients' various characteristics cannot be treated as an umbrella term. They might have, we might have to have individualized treatment in some of the patients, not all patients, in asthma if you want to control it properly. So this slide explains how developed asthma treatment is at the moment, and especially in patients with severe asthma phenotypes of severe asthma, we have what we call biologics with us. So where I would like to, you know, take your, uh, uh, you know, uh, mind to one important area where this area, dendritic cell, uh, you know, stimulating the plasma cell to produce IgE. And if we can block the IgE with omelizumab, then we will not. We will be able to prevent the IgE from activating the mast cell. So that is one way that we have 
biologics in asthma. And then the second thing, the interleukin-4 and 13 are very important cytokines. So if we can block these cytokines in the biologic pathway by depelumab, then we will be able to see some improvement specifically in these patients. Then if we have interleukin-5 blockers like mepalizumab and benralizumab, then we can block the eosinophilic inflammation in this patient. And the novel one is tazepilumab, where we can block what we call the alarmins, where especially when you have viral infections, you can have these alarmins coming through the epithelium, and this can be blocked, TSLP, interleukin 25 and 33 can be blocked by this. So this is the amount of research and development that has been done in the asthma scenario in the world. Right? So, but... When we look at it in a realistic way, pragmatic way, when we look at 100 patients with asthma, almost 75% of them, will be, we will be able to manage properly with the simple treatments that we have. 17%, we will have what we call difficult to treat asthma. These are not difficult patients with asthma. This is difficult to treat asthma. They are in the gene of step four and five, but still they have poor asthma control. Probably most of them will have poor inhaler techniques and they will have poor compliance. So if it is corrected at that point, we only have about 4% of the people left to be defined as severe asthma per se. Where even at step four and five, we are unable to control these patients' symptoms in spite of giving the best of care. So we can understand that when you look at the asthma cohort, only one in 25 per, per people will need this type of uh, sophisticated management uh, plans. So then I would come into this chart. It's a very, very important uh, chart. When you look at asthma as a whole in the community, uh, you know, 20% will have uncontrolled symptoms. That means 80% will have some symptoms, right? So uncontrolled symptoms. And out of the, out of the 100, 25% are undertreated, only 15% are well controlled, and 40% have apparently mild asthma. I would like to build up your points to the undertreated aspect as well as the apparently mild asthma. Now, this is within bracket apparently mild asthma. Then I will be going into detail about why it is dangerous to neglect this aspect. Under treatment is our fault by the medical profession or the patients, but apparently mild asthma, it's very important to understand the gravity of apparently mild asthma and how we can manage it properly because majority of the patients, about 50% of the patients, when they come to us, have apparently mild asthma. Why is that? These apparently mild asthmatics within brackets you know, has a 33% chance of dying within the next three months with an exacerbation. And they can have severe asthmatic attacks within the next three months. And sometimes they can have very, very poor prognosis as well. So that is why we probably lose about 500,000 people per year but to asthma, which is a completely treatable condition and a controllable condition. And asthma has devastating psychological and physiological effects as well. And it is stigmatized because of that. This is a beautiful photograph drawn by an asthma patient about her asthma. And this is unfortunately one of the deaths that we had due to asthma. So apparently mild asthma, right? So this is what I was uh, trying to uh, come to bring through. 37% of the patients with acute asthma had probable apparent mild asthma. They might have one or two symptoms per week. They didn't have possible nocturnal symptoms in the past three months. They would have had a simple cough, a bit of wheezing and a chest tightness in the preceding three months. But when you look at the acute asthma attacks, one out of three are typed of uh, like them, not the severe asthma patients. 16% patients, one out of five are having fatal asthma with apparently mild asthma. And 20% of them, of the patients who are dying, had apparently mild asthma. I think it is now very important to identify this group of people if we are if we want to prevent asthma morbidity and mortality. And that is one of the major tasks of my talk today. Right? Why do they why do they die? One of the main reasons that they die is the earlier treatment choice of asthma was a bronchodilator. 
as required bronchodilator for this mild, that means apparently mild asthma. So when we have a bronchodilator with, it, with us, they usually take the bronchodilator, but they don't take the appropriate treatment, which is the anti-inflammatory treatment that is needed in most of the instances to control the eosinophilic inflammation that is underlying this pathophysiology. Right. And uh, frequent use of SABA or short-acting bronchodilators or now fast-acting bronchodilator, beta agonist, have adverse side effects, as you know, beta receptor down regulation, decreased bronchoprotection, and rebound hyperresponsiveness. And they have increased allergic response and increased eosinophilic eosinophilic inflammation because they are not taking the steroid with the CDC. Right? So when we use high SABAs, obviously they have a poor outcome. Right? So that is why in from 2019, it no longer recommends salbutamol only for the step one treatment of asthma. Right? right, so what do we have in 2023, the GINA guideline? Basically, inside, actually in, in adults, we have this low dose steroid plus fast acting beta agonist and long-active beta agonist combination. So formaterol is a drug which has a rapid onset of action as well as a long action as well. So it has fast action, fast acting, and it has a larva, long acting bronchodilator effect as well. So when we have that with a combination of steroids, it can be used as a maintenance as well as a relief therapy, specifically in what we call mild asthma. So when you have that combination, Whenever you take the long acting, uh, that means this inhaler, you will get a relief and the patient will continue to take the inhaler because he's getting a relief. And at the same time, you will get the steroid inside you as well so that your inflammation will be treated. Right? So there have been two studies actually to say this, uh, to confirm this. And they have compared the maintenance low dose ICS plus as needed SABA with, uh, with I ICS and formaterol combination and risk of severe exacerbations are similar. Symptoms were slightly more, not worsening in the two months and FENO was slightly high, uh, but there is, uh, you know, usually they have similar effects on when we use the SABA as well as the bronchodilator uh, steroid together. Right. So that is one of the most important messages that we can think about because now people tend to ask for relief because uh, whenever they have asthma, whatever the pathophysiology, they tend to need relief from what they suffering, what they suffer. So they usually, when they have a reliever mechanism or a salbutamol inhaler or a short acting inhaler, they tend to use that inhaler rather than taking the steroid inhaler. So that has driven the morbidity and mortality up in asthma treatment. But when we have this combination of fast acting as well as a steroid combination, then in most of the patients, then it will have a beneficial effect. Right. So, the next important aspect that I would like to discuss in asthma is that some of these patients, especially when I come through pregnant patients, they are most likely undertreated. They have uncontrolled symptoms of asthma. So why do we have uncontrolled or undertreatment of asthma, especially in pregnancy? Now, when we look at the pathophysiology of pregnancy, because pregnancy is an immune, dis you know, immune dysfunctional state to a certain extent, one third of the pregnant patient has exacerbations of their asthma and one third will have improvements of their asthma depending on their cytokine profile as well as their immune system mechanisms. But unfortunately, most of the patients who are having asthma are not on the proper treatment. So up to 45% of the patients with asthma because of this reason have moderate to severe exacerbation during their pregnancy. 
So why do they basically don't take the treatment? Why do they have these risk factors? One important thing is there is some physiological and immunological variations. But one possibility is that not diagnosing asthma because in pregnancy, we have anyway a little bit of shortness of breath and severe dysfunction. So probably as physicians, we are not diagnosing asthma in pregnancy pro properly. And then because we are fearing that the patient is afraid to take the drugs and that the doctor is afraid to prescribe the drugs, sometimes there might be pres you know, prescribing hesitancy in these patients. Even if we prescribe the patient the proper inhaler and treatment, sometimes this patient, when they go home, when someone says, then that can harm their fetus, they will not take the treatment. So that might be the main reason that asthma is pro not properly controlled in the Sri Lankan context. So are these real drugs really safe? Yes. So according to the BTS and site guidelines, the risk of harm to the fetus from severe or chronically undertreated asthma outweighs any small risk from the medication used to control asthma. So that is the important message that we have to give our uh, doctors about asthma in pregnancy. So we can use, basically, the butacinide is one of the safest inhalers that we can give in patients with asthma. Even combination uh, therapies can be given safely in asthma. So if you want to do an inhaler in pregnancy, butacinide uh, inhaler is a, one of the things that we can do. But if the patient cannot afford in the government sector, beclomethrone is another thing that we can use. Another important aspect of asthma management is that the misdiagnosis of asthma. Asthma is a clinical diagnosis. It's a difficult diagnosis to make in certain instances. So for example, right? So this uh, lady had the book having the management of diagnosis of bronchial asthma. And we can see how the lungs are completely damaged. She actually has pulmonary hypertension with chronic pulmonary fibrosis. So if we listen to these lungs properly, you will hear the fine and coarse creps, not the wrong kind that is typically they are in asthma. So we have these types of patients coming into a clinic with the diagnosis. No one is uh, actually thinking about the diagnosis. We are continuously prescribing Beclet and Astelin to them at the primary care setting, even at the hospital setting. So this is thing, thing that we have to change, hopefully. And in this patient, you know, this is bronchial asthma exacerbation. It is still, so this a gentleman is 60 years old has a smoking history, and rather than asthma, this is most likely COPD or asthma COPD overlap. Why, you are, why are we worried about diagnosis COPD and asthma? Because the treatment is different in COPD and asthma. So in COPD, the mainstay treatment are long-acting muscarinic antagonist and beta agonist, but in asthma, the mainstay of treatment is inhalers with steroids. So the reason is that asthma is a non-specific diagnosis. They present with cough, wheezing, chestitis, and shortness of breath. And the definition doesn't help us much. But one of the most important thing in asthma is that this variability of symptoms, they can be completely normal for two or three months, but they can get an acute exacerbation. This variability of severity and the variability of severity and depending on the time is one thing that we might have to think when we are thinking about asthma. This patient might say, did you have wheezing? No, I didn't have wheezing. But did you have it previously? Yes, I had for about two or three months. Then I was better. Then again, I got it. And when you look at the history again, probably he has had an attack, even a near fatal attack at the hospital. So we might have to seek out this history from our patients when we are thinking about asthma in diagnosis, right? And then the triggers, specific triggers that this patient has will help us to diagnose asthma, right? So there are basic some features that might help in diagnosis, generally more than one type of respiratory symptoms, variability over time and intensity, and worsening at night, nocturnal uh, in, uh, or waking up increase and there are triggers and sometimes prone to get viral infections as well. So the test for asthma, we can actually do a spirometry, but because it's a variable airway disease, you will sometimes not see the changes that we expect in obstructive airway disease. Sometimes it might be completely normal, but if we see an obstruction, this specific COVID of the red line that we see here, and when we inhale, salbutamol, and then we check the reversibility, then if it is coming back to normal, we, can't, we can think that it is a reversible airway disease. 
And uh, there are ways of measuring airway hyperresponsiveness, methacholine hyperresponsiveness, which are not very freely available to diagnose asthma. So hence, asthma remains a clinical diagnosis, especially in exercise-induced asthma, especially in athletes, we can use the eucapnic voluntary hyperventilation testing to diagnose asthma, because if we diagnose asthma in athletes, it is it, if we can treat it properly, we can improve and enhance their performances better than not treating them, right? And uh, these are the peak excretory flow rates, which are very simple to maintain. You can look at the diurnal variation and see to see and prove that it is a variable airway obstruction that the patient has. And specifically, if we are looking at the workplace asthma, we can ask the patient to take the peak excretory flow rate up to the workplace and see this dip as soon as he's having wheezing symptoms or abnormal respiratory symptoms, right? Exhale nitric oxide, even though it is helpful to diagnose eosinophilic asthma, it is not that helpful to diagnose other types of asthma. So basically that is, asthma is a clinical diagnosis and there is no standard deviation and we don't have any clear evidence-based recommendations to how to make a diagnosis. So that is why we need to go for the clinical acumen uh, and to diagnose patients with asthma because some of them are underdiagnosed, some of them are actually overdiagnosed. And sometimes asthma comes in certain different ways. Now this lady actually investigated for back pain and specifically when, when she when we inquire, she has this pain and chest pain specifically when the patient is having any cold environment and when the patient is in the nocturne in the night as well as in the early morning. And sometimes we just treat them with painkillers, but when the patient is having narrowed airways, the resistance to the airflow is reduced and the thoracic cavity has to you know, expand this lung against a huge resistance. So some of our patients, especially I have seen this in females, can't come with chest pain or back pain with asthma. Right? So the other thing is we are sometimes overdiagnosing asthma because we don't have proper diagnosis. Right? So these are some differential diagnosis that we have to think when we are considering asthma, especially when we are having thinking about the treatment of asthma, I think we have to think about COPD as most one of the most important differential diagnosis, especially if the patient is an elderly patient and they have a history of smoking and this patient has valvular heart disease with pulmonary hypertension and the bronchiectasis is very common we will hear cause Krebs in these patients instead of bronchi, and sometimes even tuberculosis can present to us, like mimicking asthma, and sometimes you can have endobronchial tumors presenting like asthma, and sometimes this is one of the bronchoscopes, this patient can be cough, intractable cough and wheezing, and we can see the tumor that is there in the left main bronchus obstructing the air. So, Diagnosing asthma, thinking about the mimics is one of the most important aspects that we have to think. So specifically, sometimes when these patients come in the pregnant state, when they are really ill, sometimes we might think about this as asthma, but we, this is finally tend to be, this patient was actually treated for asthma, but we from diagnose coca with uh, pulmonary edema in this patient. Right. So in asthma, even though there are changes, significant changes in the recent past, I think one of the most important things that we have to understand is to think about the asthma mimics before starting commencing treatment asthma in the patients. And the second important thing is if we are thinking about asthma, to start the patient on appropriate treatment, which includes anti-inflammatory treatment. So this is a case report of a 13-year-old girl who had episodes of cough and wheezing. He had to have treatment at least once a month, two episodes of hospitalization, once a severe attack needing management at the base hospital. Mother and only sibling has wheezing as well, poor social economic state, crowded room, exposure to fire. He has bedwetting, proper, proper, poor performance at uh, school, avoid physical activity as in most of the instances, and the reason that all this child had this problem was, this was not in actually in the culture area, but in another hospital, this is not the patient's photograph, which was taken from the internet, but basically this is the type of patient that we see in a daily basis. 
these patients are probably given salbutamol, 1 milligram TDS, theophylline, and uh, given a little bit of steroid and an antibiotic and sent home without addressing the possibility of underlying asthma in most of the instances. Even if we have identified it as asthma, sometimes we don't prescribe the steroid inhaler that is available in the government sector, which is very, it's free, almost free of charge, it's about 600 rupees. And sometimes we uh, prescribe the salbutamol inhaler only for this patient. And sometimes we, after we pre even prescribe this patient appropriate inhaler with a short acting bronchodilator, sometimes we don't address the problems that are there at home. Advise the patient on proper, you know, at least reducing the indoor air pollution and addressing the father's uh, smoking habit. So asthma is not a simple management. It's not a simple diagnosis. It's not a simple treatment. It is a holistic management that we have to. Uh, understand. So real life treatment is like this. So this patient actually came to me with asthma, and uh, when we when I he said that he was in an inhaler, and when we look at the inhaler that the patient has, he had a whole load of salbutamol inhalers instead of the treatment that she should be on. No steroid inhaler at all. So what we what they usually do is when they go to the hospital, they collect this inhaler, keep this, and they use it. And they think that one inhaler is not different from the other. So they have this, and this gives them relief. And because of that, they use that rather than the steroid inhaler that they use. So these are the factors that we have to consider. And this is one inhaler, you know, you can see the amount of um, sediment that is there in the inhaler in this patient. So probably, you know, we should know how to treat the asthma. Mm -hmm. Yes, we should know the therapeutics. But at the same time, one of the major aspects of therapeutics is giving the proper treatment in the correct way. And if you look at this space, you can see the, this, you know, the sediment that are there. It's not properly clean and it is old and you might not expect anything, right? And there are patient factors as well. I usually put this when I talked about asthma. You know, there are various excuses that our patients give for not taking treatment. And, uh, you know, one thing is so they sometimes take the inhaler in a wrong way. Right, and I think this is uh, this video you have shown. Just you said they fixed it, but it didn't make any difference at all. Well, sometimes yeah. doctors make mistakes, yeah. and uh, right, why is it hard to fix? It? Using your inhaler all the time, you go through one a week. Sure, you using it right. Do I look like an idiot? No. Why don't you show me how your inhaler? So uh, even though uh, in in countries where we think there's a high literacy rate, there is if you take hundred people, sixty five percent of them are not taking the inhaler properly, and they are not taking the correct inhaler. So especially looking at the inhaler when they come is very important to see. My there are other factors. I think this is a very very uh, popular uh, photograph. Now, when we look at, unfortunately, in the hospitals, we really don't have simple inhalers. I think Sir will agree because we don't have even vector methasone sometimes. We don't have uh, salmoprofutic soap combination. We don't have, even though now the guideline says formatrobutazenide should be there even for mild asthma, we don't have that combinations with us. And sometimes we struggle when we are treating them. We don't have spaces. We don't have sometimes the devices. So hopefully, I think together, uh, the College of Physicians, the SLMA and our college, I think we should actually make available with these medicines at even the primary care. And yesterday I had a meeting at around 2 p.m. with the primary care, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Champika and other people. So we were able to push these uh, inhalers to the primary care uh, setup so that most of these asthma patients can be managed because they can't afford, sometimes they can't even need because if the economic crisis and the economic problems they have, they really can't spend their money on treatment. And they then come with severe exacerbations and poor mobility, right? So I would like to take you back to this uh, photograph and remember this because even though we know the state of the art of asthma treatment, we might know everything about biologics, everything about the pathophysiology of asthma. And we really know the latest GINA guidelines 
to say that, okay, this is the drug that we have to give, not this. You know, if we don't correct it to consider in the patient factors, right? How educated they are, are we giving the correct message? Are there any comorbidities or any other problems that we have to sort it out? Is the patient taking the inhaler properly? What are the barriers that they have? Do they have any economic problems that they are not taking the drugs? So then our outcome of asthma in Sri Lanka would be poor. But if we can address this as a medical profession, I think we will have a better future. The best example is what I say in teenage girls or boys when they come to me is that if you even if you have asthma, you can even climb Mount Everest. You can be the best athlete in the world. There are many, many examples of you know the swimmers having asthma, but they have performed brilliantly. Some of them have seven or eight gold medals. And some of these athletes, I think if I remember correct, Jackie. Joy Casey, he is one of the best female athletes that America has ever produced. She has asthma. But if we correctly prescribe and manage asthma, I think our children will have better outcomes. And in this photograph, two children have asthma, actually. I don't want to name them. But basically, that is what we have to do. And probably our next Susantika child singer is probably suffering from asthma, waiting somewhere not properly being treated. And some of the, the next professor of medicine might be suffering, not being able to go into school uh, day in a daily basis. And they suffer because of this simple disease which can be completely corrected in 96% of the time. And only the 3% will need expert care in this. So that is the main important message that I would like to give. Thank you very much for your time. and. Uh, uh, hopefully, I think it was useful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Jandan, uh, for that very comprehensive coverage of, uh, of this topic. Uh, starting from basic pathophysiology, the, the new, um, uh, new pathophysiological mechanisms, uh, the uh, conditions. Um, and as well as uh, uh, touching on the holistic management of that population. I mean, that was quite comprehensive knowledge. Thank you so much for that. We have some questions actually um, that has come to the chat forum. Um, we take them uh, one by one. So there's a question Is there any difference in the efficacy between salvitrol, which is truly the soul, and the recommended uh, in a produce derived uh, from the um, population? I think that's a very good question. Uh, so I think when you look at the when you are when you're treating a patient, you know there are real world uh, things. You know when the patient is in a in a study, if you probably compare salmetrofluticasone and formetrofluticasone, there might not be a significant amount of difference. But efficacy wise, I have never seen that there is a difference. But when we look at the real world data. If you look at salmetrol foticasone, salmetrol has a late onset action, even though it has a long action. It's a larva, but it takes some time to act. And when a patient is having symptoms, if you take salmetrol foticasone, it will not give the patient relief. So usually with salmetrol foticasone, you have to prescribe salbutamol or turbitulin for that patient. So we have to have two inhalers in the patient. But in formatrol medicine, we can, most of the instances, not when you have severe asthma, but in most of the instances that you can use a single inhaler. So when you are practically thinking about that, practically using, people will tend to like to use a single inhaler and they will use that in a regular basis rather than when you, when you have two inhalers. So what we have to advise when you have salmetrol fluticasone is you take the salmetrol fluticasone, well, the Salvitable uh, inhaler, and then you have to take the salmonella protein. So, yeah, so that is why I think practically, when you think about the real world practice, the combination of formatrol medicine will have better compliance and better outcomes theoretically than salmonella Thank you very much. Because we ask, uh, you know, the cost difference between uh, the two Currently, uh, I can't exactly come out with the uh, values. Formatrol butyrosinide NDI inhaler starts from about 1,600 to 1,700 rupees NDI, either those and goes up to about 2,700. Some of them are there up to 5,000. Uh, 
but about the beta dose about 1600 and the formatrobipsinoid uh, capsule will be costing about if i remember correct 2022 20, rupees when i last checked but uh, when you look at the prices of the salvatrofluticus if you look at certain brands it is sometimes more expensive than this one so Expenses wise, uh, probably there is not much of difference. So, so there, if there is no big difference in the yeah. cost of the yes, and then uh, we can manage one, yes, uh, with one retailer yes. compared to two retailers, yes. I think uh, yes. there is such another problem. Yes, and if you combine the uh, at, uh, cost of salvitamol inhaler plus, plus like this thing, so probably it might go more beyond the cost. Yeah. In fact, we can make this recommendation to the ministry also because I don't think uh, we have combat in, in the. No, yesterday actually we pushed it. Oh. Uh, so we had a meeting with the NCD director uh, through Zoom. So uh, for the primary care, we, we tried our best. And uh, this year I'm the president of the college. So yesterday I had had the meeting. So hopefully, with the help of my colleagues, Ravini and uh, um, uh, Rupul, we were able to you know tell them that rather than having more of salvi tomorrow yeah. or theophilic in the formulatory of the primary care physician, please help us have formatural beauty design and high so yeah. that we can manage our COPD and asthma patients better. Exactly, and, and that could actually uh, you know be more easy for the patients because yes. you don't need to you know give this explanation you can yes. start by yes. Yes. That's a lot of confusion. That's why I showed that photograph. You know, some of them only have the blue in there. Very right? yeah. because, uh, you know, yes. Yes. Uh, another question. Any safety guide, dietary guide uh, to bronchitis? Uh, that's, that's, that's a controversial topic. I deserve a agree. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so there, there are, you know, not in asthma, especially there are some certain foods that might trigger an allergic reaction in you and you can create a little bit of a bronchospasm. Uh, and uh, we probably should avoid these type of food, uh, food after identifying that it causes this type of a reaction. But when, what I usually tell my patients is that when the asthma is properly controlled, so the first question that I ask when they come the next month is, can you eat an ice cream? They should be able to. Because when the when the lungs are damaged and when the lungs are inflamed, any small trigger can trigger this hyperresponsiveness. It can be a little bit of dust, it can be the exercise, a little bit of stress, or eating ice cream or yogurt. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you can't eat it after you get the proper control. So probably after getting a proper control, we might you know be able to slowly add on the dietary habits are, uh, you know, slowly add on, and we should not, I think, in my mind, uh, deprive these children an ice cream, uh, a yogurt, or anything, uh, simply because you are afraid to give it to them. So when you are controlled, I think it, you can eat anything. That's, that's a good piece of education, right? Yes. 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 Then uh, another question, uh, what is a realistic treatment endpoint? For our patients, as far as controlling symptoms and being a normal living, you know, yeah. I think that's a very good question, right? So, normal will depend on person to person. What I have seen, what we described as normal is, especially when patients are adults, they say about thirty to thirty-five age group comes to me, and when I ask them, when they have some symptoms of cough, I ask them symptoms of asthma. So I ask them, do you have breathlessness when you walk? They say, no, not a kissy Prashna. They will say, okay. So then I ask, can you climb three flights of stairs? They can't. They feel breathless at the second flight. So for a 35-year-old, that is abnormal. So what pe people usually do is, they think that it is normal. And they don't seek treatment. So realistically wise, I think depending on the age group, our targets will be different. Right? So in a, you know, you know adolescents, I would expect the child to have a completely normal life. Normal life means the child should be able to bathe without any problem. He should be able to, if they want to, you know, go and have a bath in the rain, that child or adolescent should be able to do that. If you go, if you want to go and hike on Hantana, that child should be able to do that without any problem. If you want to do swimming, yes, that child will be able to do that. If you want to use an ice cream, that adolescent should be able to use an, you know, eat an ice cream without any hesitation. 
So that's a level of control that I expect in my patients. Uh, you know, in a in an adult, you know, she, she or especially if you think about a busy mother who is working as well as looking after the children, you know, she should be able to work and do her do her things without feeling tired at the end of the day. Um, you know, every mother will be tired, uh, but anyway, you know, this exceptional tiredness and the, the inability to do her things, daily functions. That will restrict that person. So that restriction should be. Oh, mom, that is <laughs> asthma with an athlete. Asthma should not be a factor that is restricting his performance. Okay. So, so what is normal for that person? They should be able to. You know, that's a very good question. Now, asthma is basically we are describing as a reversible airway disease. In most of the patients, it's a eosinophilic inflammation. CO2. Uh, it is basically due to a noxious substance, and it is basically neutrophil driven, driven inflammation where the airways are damaged as well as the supporting structure is damaged, hence you will get MPC man bronchitis. So these are two completely different aspects. But in Sri Lanka, what I have seen is that our patients, about 50% of them, most of them have asthma and they can develop COPD, if they are exposed to, especially about what they see in females, when they are exposed to fire for a long time, or when they are smokers, I'm they I'm can have features of asthma. As well as so they can have high pain plated lungs. They can have increasing amount of years. They can have a family history of rhinitis. They can have a certain degree of you know, reversibility. So to define asthma COPD, you have to have a 40, 400 millimeter reversibility in patients uh, with the airway obstruction. So these patients, early it was called asthma, CO, uh, asthma COPD overlap syndrome, and we took it together. But now we consider asthma and COPD coexisting together. Right? So in these patients, we know that in pure COPD, the first line of treatment is anti-muscular, long-acting anti As required, beta agonist, yes, and then long-acting anti And in certain, uh, the C group or the the, when you have recurrent exacerbations and when the yes of count is high only, we add a steroid uh, to this treatment with pure COPD patients. But when you have asthma and COPD overlap, that is an indication to start a steroid early on rather than late. So I would then, if I'm suspecting that, I would rather start a you know, combination of steroid and long acting bronchodilator and add a long acting muscular catheter as well at the first stage. Um, then, uh, the question, how do you integrate uh, uh, APF uh, 25 to 75 in the diagnosis of asthma? Is there a cutoff uh, improvement level post-doctor diet? Probably I'm not the best person to answer that. I'm not a physiologist, but uh, according to the knowledge that I have, FP1 25 to 50, uh, 75, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's not a very specific uh, marker for small diarrhea disease. Uh, in a in a person, if you monitor the FE one fifty and three to seventy five, yes, we can make it. We can take it as a you know when we have a change, we can interpret it accordingly. But uh, in a in a person, when we want to diagnose asthma, that might not be a proper marker uh, for asthma. So I, according to my knowledge, I I usually don't actually you know look at the FE one twenty five to seventy five in majority of the patients. Uh, and uh, the clinical utilization is has not come, uh, you know, with the with the evidence uh, base, unfortunately. Well, I think uh, final question: What is the value of biological treatment? A good question again. So, actually, I have been given a task by one of my senior most consultants uh, during my year to get the biologics to Sri Lanka as much as possible. But at the same time, at the moment, biologics, the omelizumab, uh, the mepalizumab, uh, dupilumab, uh, you know, it is not uh, available in Sri Lanka at the moment, uh, according to my knowledge, uh, freely not, definitely not freely available in the government sector. Um, but I think we have to be a little bit careful when we bring these things as well. These are very expensive drugs. 
and uh, you know if i have to treat 100 patients with asthma and if you can give pomotropin this night for 100 patients and uh, if i can treat only one patient with this thing so you know as a country we might be really careful and at the same time uh, if we are prescribing biologics it should be done by a multidisciplinary discussion of severe asthma or else what will happen is we might be prescribing these biologics haphazardly causing harm and causing expense when there are you know methods of treating these patients better so i think you say yourself and the therapeutic committee of the slma also can uh, you know help us so our our plan is to we are bringing the biology yes we should give that opportunity to our patients we should make them available because some of them will have problems and they will need biologics when they have severe asthma but it should be prescribed in appropriate way. So hopefully we can make an advance of that. Good. Thank you very much for that. I admire your stand on that. I think that's a very rational and a very uh, appropriate uh, stand on the uh, on the use of biology. So I think that's the stand that we need today because sometimes you might make the biology, uh, uh, biology available at the expense of the uh, you know inhalers, the treatment control large number of patients. So that is what has happened actually in this country. Um, we, we don't have the essential medicine, but we might be having the very high end one. So we should not uh, even have that happen. So I think that's why it is with the uh, any any other question as we continue to the audience and uh, yeah, it is a pleasure to have you, sir. And uh, yes, uh, any questions that you have, sir? Um well I think there is uh, an important thing that when people talk of biologics and like, all the studies that have come out from the West, that, um, that, talk of, that all the uh, results have been from the West, I think there is a difference in the, in the asthma as a disease and also their response to people uh, in different parts. There is a very small geographic. Uh, uh, difference in that. So, I mean, as you correctly said, I mean, do we go in for a very expensive drug? We just be given parenterally, uh, regularly, and great cost. Um, where do we really need that? So, I think, you know, that, that a piece of the time being, uh, that, that is an important uh, thing. The second thing, you now, as far as my particular interest are concerned, it's about pediatrics. Uh, so, in addition, I mean, I totally agree with you on what you said about uh, the economic drugs that we to the steroids that we could use. And we have worked on this, and we have shown very that the cost effectiveness of this uh, is quite striking, uh, especially in children in whom we have done the work. Um, but in children, in addition to the standard treatment of uh, uh, Steroids. Uh, sometimes we have to use other yes. drugs like Montelukast yes. and Lutepain. Yes. yes. What I'm really wanted to ask you was: uh, Is the little bit concerning about the recent development, maybe over the last year or so, where there have been warnings from uh, the West about uh, some of the neuropsychiatric uh, uh, symptoms? Of one to oh, one to yes. How common is it really? I mean, um, or is, is it something that is being looked out of court and in the West? Yes. To be quite honest, I mean, I've been using quite a bit of it because of the convenience and um, the, the necessity to use it because it's a little bit of controlling necessary and, and also it's easier to administer and you know, it comes in doable forms and things like that. And lots of things that you have to take into account. I have seen the little psychiatric things that they described only in one patient in whom I had to withdraw it. Uh, the child was actually waiting to go to step by and was very mm -hmm. difficult to control. Mm -hmm. And the thing settled when I do the drug. Right. But I don't think it's to the same extent that people make it out in the way. So I would like to uh, your home. <laughs> yes, uh, um, I know. Especially as you said, sir, in the, in the pediatric population. So when there is no pediatric pharmacology, some of these patients are referred to me sometimes, uh, especially when I was in the periphery. So uh, most of them have allergic rhinitis with asthma. So as you said, we need to use antihistamine 
versus spray, it's sometimes combined with a multi-newcast uh, uh, lipotron inhibitor uh, for the control, better control of asthma. And uh, what I, there are two main side effects that have been suggested due to multi-newcast. One of the thing is whether it increases the incidence of church stroke syndrome, uh, eosinophilic granulomatosis. So that's one way the thing that was having concern in the literature. And the second thing is, as you correctly said, whether they cause whether it whether it causes causes behavioral changes in children. So the thing is that, sir, I think you will you will agree with me. These side effects are very difficult to identify. You know, these are personality traits. We really don't know whether this child, you know, this unless as you said has a you know new personal trait, which might be also be attributed to a social state, you know, mother has left the country or something like that. So then it's very difficult to know whether this is true or not. So my fallback mechanism is that I usually start them for a short term, uh, for about one or two months. And after I get the proper control, as soon as possible, I withdraw it. Withdraw it and then I try to control with the other drugs. And most of them that I have been treating, we are able to withdraw the Montelukas in about two to three months maximum. So, uh, and in adults, Montelukas is used, especially when you have obesity associated asthma, especially in females. When they have uh, nasal polyps and aspirin sensitivity, you know, they tend to respond to Montelukas better than other people. So, in those patients, I tend to use Montelukas a little bit longer. Um, so, that is my practice point, sir. Yes. Could agree with you more. Yes. Um. Uh, but I think the other aspect from this is that, uh, as we have shown in some of the work that we have done in Canada as well, that uh, there is a much higher proportion of children in whom you may be able to withdraw yes. the drugs without the uh, troubles of later. Yes. And this, of course, has to be uh, balanced with the onset of puberty. Yes. 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 Things that way. But I think, as you quite rightly said, that uh, the, the initial thing is to give them a normal life. Yes. And the number of uh, children that I have seen who have never had a bath, yes. who have never had the pleasure of yes. being able to have an ice cream, yes. um, I have seen these tremendous. And also, that this can be used almost as an incentive for them, the children to continue the Yes. yes. Uh, because, um, you know, it's, it's a bit difficult with children. Yeah, which is as difficult being adults as well. To when they recover or they are under control, mm -hmm. they are asking why should we keep on taking these drugs mm -hmm. all the time? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, as well. Uh, and this is some of the things that the, the, the things that we can use. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are much better. They actually really understand you better. Yes. Uh, they say, if you want a normal life, if you want to play the, the game, if you want to stream. Mm -hmm. Uh, in fact, swimming is pretty yes. good. Actually. Yes. And, and uh, I think uh, Radcliffe and so many of these swimmers who have mm. broken uh, the records all over the world, uh, and you mentioned uh, Jackie Joyner yes. first. Yes. Uh, I don't know how many medals, I think, something like eight or nine medals. Some go most in gold, a couple of silver, and a couple of things. And they have been at the uh, at the four different Olympics, that is, yes, sort of kind of 16 years, 16 years, over a period of 16 years. So that shows how good mm -hmm. uh, the control, how, how, how good control yes. can give a normal life. And it is in a era, sir, we didn't have uh, most of these asthma drugs, new asthma drugs. Yes. yes. And Jackie Joyner Curse is the elder sister, yes. who is the, the other champion who had. Uh, and actually, I think she he passed away. I think you know the opponent uh, that she had multiple uh, attacks. Uh, but uh, I think I know she sort of um, did brilliantly on uh, good control of the disease. Uh, so uh, I think that that's great uh, discussion. So I think both uh, you and Sir uh, Sir and you are highlighting that they can be the uh, normal life. Normal life. One, one, uh, uh, another question, uh, Rajan, is there any update on management of acute severe asthma and life-threatening asthma? Um, the basic principles of managing acute severe asthma and life-threatening asthma has not been changed recently, no. 
So basically, uh, an important thing is to identify that a certain asthma is a life threatening asthma. So I will basically go by the carbon dioxide level. If the carbon dioxide level is rising and the patient is having difficulty in breathing, you have to be very, very careful in asthma patient, not a CAD patient. And then the treatment of oxygen is bronchodilation. And uh, then anti inflammation, and if the patient has an infection, uh, go for uh, antibiotics. And sometimes uh, we might want to support her or with ventilation as well. Yeah, uh, that, that's I think it's a very good question. But uh, you know, most of the studies and the biologics are towards the uh, spectrum, TH2 type of information. Uh, but TH17 and TH1 type of information, uh, asthma is coming out now. So in, in the neutrophilic asthma, they have uh, you know tried to block the TNF alpha and the uh, interleukin one, and but they have not shown any significant benefit, to my knowledge. And uh, there are some types of asthma where they are, basically there are abnormalities and neuromodulators. So you have the airways and you have the uh, neural pathways, and there are abnormalities of substance P and other neurosubstances which can cause you know triggering of the airway. Uh, narrowing without any inflammation. So post-inflammatory, post uh, post-cellular. So there, probably the our treatment options should be different. Maybe we might have to think about neuromodulation. So that is why so asthma is coming into the picture in a big way. We are going into individualized treatment. But what I think as assessors, and this is a new suggestion, we should never, never lose the big picture. Because 97% of the asthma can be controlled with the triple treatment that we have. So if there are many differences in the treatment, that would be the biologics that you see. Then. Biologics. But yes. otherwise, standard uh, treatment, the, yes, the, yeah. the bronchodilation and the uh, and the country yes. use other things. Yeah. Well, there, are, there are certain difficult asthma that we might have to do the oxygen steroids. You know, there can be coexisting allergic bronchial aspergillosis. So when the patient is not improving, we look at the clinics and you know there is a way of that we approach a problem. But most of the asthma we usually be able to treat. Okay, I think uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nanako, for this uh, very interesting and comprehensive coverage and uh, excellent uh, answers. Uh, I also thank all the audience, including the uh, music and two others who in the audience, as well as the others who joined online. We had been ninety actually um, on the uh, on the web uh, joining us, so uh, and they, there was active participation from everybody. So thank you very much. So that has been so my pleasure to um, give you this uh, technical representation. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm sorry for the delay again. <laughs> sorry.